In this video, I want to talk about cosets. Cosets end up being very important in abstract algebra, but before we get to cosets, let's talk a little bit about where they come from. Let G be a group and let H be a subgroup of G, and we're going to let A and B be elements of G. And we're going to define a relation, and I'll call this with a little tilde L, a relation L here on G. And we're going to say that A is related to B if and only if A inverse B is an element of H. Okay, so take a minute to absorb this and see if you can understand what it's saying. So this is a relation. It's not yet an equivalence relation, but maybe we can try and show that it's an equivalence relation. And if you remember, there are three things that we need to show if we want to show that something is an equivalence relation. And they're easy to remember, they're alphabetical, it's just RST, reflexive, symmetric, transitive. So let's take a look at these and see if we can figure out how we might go ahead and prove this. So let's start with reflexive. What does it mean to be reflexive? Well, that means that A is related to A. Or you could say A is equivalent to A once we know it's an equivalence relation. Okay, well, what does that mean? Well, if we look at the definition, that would mean that A inverse A is an element of H. So let's look at that. A inverse A. Well, what is A inverse A? Oh, that's just the identity. Remember, A belongs to G. So since A belongs to G, there's also an A inverse in G. And so then A inverse A would be the identity. But remember that H is a subgroup of G. So that means that the identity is an H, which means that A inverse A is an H, and then we've shown that it's reflexive. Okay, how about symmetric? That's the one that says that A is related to B, and that implies B is related to A. Okay, so let's see. I guess we should start with this. A is related to B. That means that A inverse B is an element of H. And I want to show that that is going to imply here that B inverse A is an element of H. Hmm, how am I going to get from this thing to that thing? We'll have to switch the order around. And what do I know about H? H is a subgroup. We already saw that it has the identity. Uh, it also means that if something is in H, now what else can I say? How about its inverse? is an H. In other words, A inverse B inverse has to be an H because inverses have to be an H. Okay, I can rewrite this. This is the same thing as B inverse A inverse inverse, and that's the same thing as B inverse A, and hey look, that's what I wanted. B inverse A to be an H. Okay, so now how about transitive? That's the one that says that if I have A related to B and B related to C, that those two things together imply that A is related to C. So let's rewrite all these things, kind of like I did for symmetric. That's maybe a good uh, starting point. So if A is related to B, that means that A inverse B is an element of H. And if B is related to C, that means B inverse C is an element of H. And so Collectively, I want to show that these things imply that A inverse C is an element of H. Okay, so again, I have to think about what I know here. I know H is a subgroup, so I already used the idea that the identity was an H and inverses are an H. Um, I also have closure and associativity. Well, I have two things in H here. So if H is a subgroup and it's closed, that means when I use the binary operation together on these two elements, I should be able to get something else in H. So let's try that. So that would be that A inverse B together with B inverse C. What's that equal to? That's, well, it's associative since H is a subgroup, so I can rearrange the parentheses and have the B and B inverse together. That's just the identity. And so then I get A inverse C is in H. And look, that's what I wanted. So I'm good to go. Okay, I think we're ready for a formal proof. Okay, so there is the statement of the relation. 
And here's the thing I want to prove. Let G be a group and let H be a subgroup of G. Then this relation is an equivalence relation on G. So here's the proof. Let A and B be elements of G. And we need to show that this relation is reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. So we're going to go through them one by one. First, reflexive. And I want to note that A inverse A is the identity. But the identity is in H because H is a subgroup and it has an identity. So A inverse A must be an element of H and therefore A is related to A. So therefore it's reflexive. Okay, symmetric. Suppose that A is related to B. That tells us that A inverse B is an element of H. Now H is a subgroup, so H has inverses. So the inverse of A inverse B must be an H. But A inverse B collectively inversed, I can rewrite that as eventually B inverse A. So B inverse A is an H, and that means B is related to A, and therefore this is symmetric. Okay, one more transitive. Suppose A is related to B and that B is related to C. That tells us that A inverse B must be an H and B inverse C must be an H. But H is closed because it's a subgroup, so I can put these together and use the binary operation on A inverse B and B inverse C. And after a little bit of algebra here, you get to A inverse C being an element of H. So therefore, a is related to C, and since I now have reflexive, symmetric, and transitive, I know that this must be an equivalence relation on G. So we've shown that this thing is an equivalence relation on G, and remember it was defined by A is related to B if and only if A inverse B is an H. And I can now say A is equivalent to B since it's an equivalent relation. And now I have another relation. So I have A related to B if and only if A, B inverse is an H. So you see I kind of swapped the order of the A and the B where the inverses were. Um, so the, the L and the R, you might guess, refer to left and right. And we'll see at the end of the video uh, how that exactly works. But for now, just keep in mind that there's two different equivalence relations. And it's possible to show that they're both equivalence relations. And you can show that the right one is an equivalence relation using a very similar proof. In fact, it might be a good idea as an exercise to just try and show that, see if you can work through that. So now I have a theorem. Let G be a group and let H be a subgroup of G. Define the relation, and this is the left one on G, by A is equivalent to G if and only if A inverse B is an H. And define the relation, and then I have the right one on G by A is related to B if and only if A, B inverse is an H. Then these are both equivalence relations on G. Okay, so there's my theorem. And we know that an equivalence relation on G determines a partition on G. And this is where we're going to start to get into cosets, because it turns out these partitions are going to be very much related to what we're uh, interested in here for our video. So recall that we denote the cell of the partition containing A as A with the little brackets around it, the square brackets. And the following theorem considers the equivalence classes, and we're going to look at just the left ones, although you could also do a similar thing for the right-hand ones. So here's the theorem. Let G be a group and let H be a subgroup of G, and we're going to define this relation on G the same way we did before. Then the equivalence class of A looks like the set of all A's times H's, such that H is a member of that subgroup H. So that's, that's uh, telling us what the equivalence classes look like. Let's try and prove this. Okay, so let's think about how we might prove this theorem here. And the theorem essentially has two sets equal to each other. I have this set here, and I have this set here. And if you have two sets, let's say I have two sets A and B, and I want to show that A equals B. How do I do that? Well, the standard way to show that two sets are equal is to show that they are subsets of each other. A is a subset of B, and B is a subset of A. And that's a good thing to know. Anytime you have a proof that asks you to show two sets are equal, what you want to do is try and show that they're subsets of each other. It's a very standard technique uh, for, for proving something like this. So in particular, I want to show that the equivalence class containing A is a subset of this set here of all the AHs. 
So that's one thing. And then I need to do the opposite of this, show that the set A H, such that all the H's are in the subgroup H, is a subset of the equivalence class containing A. Okay, so let's do this one first here. And I'll say that X is an element of the equivalence class containing A. What does that mean? Well, if it's in that equivalence class, it must be equivalent to it. So that's what that means. Or since it's symmetric, I guess I could do it the other way around. Doesn't matter. Um, so then what does this mean? Well, this means that I have this relationship here between A and B. I can just translate it to X and A. So this one means that X inverse A is an element of H. And this one means that A inverse X is an element of H. Hmm. Well, the goal, I guess, is to show that X looks like something like A times H. What's the best way to do it here? Well, uh, let's keep going with each, each of these. We'll just try them out. So this one says that it looks like an element of H for some little H in the subgroup H. And I can do the same thing here. Let's see if either one of these looks good. So this is both, both of these are for some H, little H in the, in the subgroup. Hmm. Well, I want to show that X looks like something like A times H. So how can I do that? Well, well, how about if I look at this one right here, and what if I imagine having an A here, and then inside here having an A? What if I did that? Well, how could I think about that? I could just say, well, X, that's the same thing as the identity times X, the same thing, right? And the identity I can rewrite as A, A inverse, and a, A inverse X, hey, that equals A, H. So if I, if I rewrite this using this idea here, I can get X looking like an element of this set here. So think about it like this. I have the identity. The identity is the same thing as A times A inverse, but that's the same thing as A times H, where this is H. H is A inverse X. And that's what I originally had here before I put the A on both sides. Okay, so I think that does it. Because now I know that H is, uh, or X is A H, and so X then must be long in this set. And I've shown that if X is in the equivalence class of A, then it's in this set over here. Okay, let's go and do the reverse. So now I'm going to say that X is an element of this set here. And I need to show then that X is an element of the equivalence class. Well, if X is a member of the set, it looks like A times H, where H, little h is in the subgroup H. And I need to show it's equivalent. Hmm, how am I gonna show that? Well, to show it's equivalent, here's the equivalence relation. So I need to show something that looks like that. So how could I do that? Well, what if I took A inverse and put it on both sides here, so something like this. And then I have A inverse X is equal to, well, A inverse A is the identity, well, it's just H. But H is a member of the subgroup H. So that tells me, according to the definition, that A is equivalent to X, and X must belong to this equivalence class. Okay, I think we're ready for a formal proof. Okay, so let's take a look at the proof. So first, let G be a group and let H be a subgroup of G. And we're gonna define this relation on G by A is equivalent to B if and only if A inverse B is an element of H. That's just the standard way that we defined it. And first, I wanna show that the equivalence class containing A is a subset of this other set, AH, such that little h is an element of the subgroup H. And I'm trying to show this. Let X be an element of that equivalence class containing A. So that means that A is equivalent to X. So that means by the definition of the equivalence relation that A inverse X must be an element of H. And that means that A inverse X equals H for some member of the subgroup H. But then X I can rewrite as the identity times X, and the identity I can write as A, A inverse, and I can regroup this, it's associative, so I can make it A times A inverse X, but A inverse X is H, 
And so that shows that x belongs to this set of all things that look like a times h, such that h belongs to the subgroup h. How about the other way around? How do I show this? So I'm going to let x be an element of this set. That means x equals a h for some element h in the subgroup h. And now I can uh, look at a inverse x. Well, that would be a inverse times a h. But a inverse a is the identity, and the identity times h is just h. So therefore, a inverse x is an element of the subgroup h, and a is equivalent to x. Therefore, x is a member of this equivalence class. Since I know that they are subsets of each other, it must be the case that the equivalence class containing A equals this set of all things A times H, such that the little h is an element of the subgroup H. So the cells of the partition determined by the equivalence relations, and we have the left and the right ones, turn out to be fairly important. In fact, we're going to use them a lot in abstract algebra. From now on, I'm going to refer to these cells as cosets. So those things that we found earlier, those actually were the cosets. So here's the definition of a coset. Let G be a group, and let A be an element of G, and let H be a subgroup of G. The subset AH, and this is just notation, A capital H. And that means the set of all A's times the little h's, where the little h's belong to the subgroup H. So that subset of G is known as the left coset of H in G. And then we have another subset where the order is reversed, and that's known as the right coset of H in G. So keep in mind that this is notation, the little a and the big H is just a way of representing either a left coset, and then if you reverse it, the right coset. And in later videos, we will see how cosets end up being really important in abstract algebra.